Hello, everybody. I hope you guys had a wonderful weekend. Um, and welcome to week four. Now, a uh, couple of things I uh, want to go over. Um, yeah, I know uh, I didn't get the Dichonomous Key video and worksheet up. I'm going to try and get that up uh, this week. Things happened because I still want you to be able to do uh, a Dichonomous Key because, like I said, some of you... Um, want to go forward in biology in some form or fashion and i assure you if you're going down uh the zoology path or anything that brings you to uh going out in the field and catching things and um bringing them back to the lab for identification you are going to uh, need to know how to run a die key uh it's just it's life <laughs> it's life in the biology world and um so i was looking around for one that wasn't too kitty and there's so many kitty ones online but i didn't want to like bust out a full crazy one that was just absolutely mind-numbing so i finally found one it took me quite a while but i found one and um, i'm gonna do that one i'm gonna start it with you and then you know with a video and then uh let you complete the rest of it because i'm one of those people that like to show you how to do it and not you know tell you and then say yeah figure it out because i hate that i hate that when teachers did it to me and i don't like doing it to my students it's just rude and unfair so that's what i want to do a little short video of doing a die key and then putting it up for you guys to finish um so hopefully something interactive uh that's what i think i'm gonna do i think because i'm learning how to make more things more interactive and also i'd like to point out i'm very sorry about the flip grid i'm trying to find new technologies to use with you guys to make it feel more interactive between us and stuff so if you've got any suggestions it's things that have been used in other classes i'm all ears so please 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 you know get back to me and let me know um i'm always open to suggestions uh and different things like that so today i don't know if your previous instructor went over this topic with you last semester or kept it for this semester if not so we're kind of going to go backwards in the book uh we're doing chapter 19 which is talking about viruses in the book it seems to talk about viruses right after uh talking about dna and rna which makes sense um but i like talking about viruses right before we get into um the domains and the kingdoms and the reason being is because these guys are kind of the big fat you know there's a rule for everything but this is the biology's version of but because these guys aren't exactly alive and they're not exactly dead they're a little weird gray very very large gray area of biology in the fact that they're kind of like real life zombies but at the same time no they're not um and there's been a war with uh these guys and bacteria for absolute since the dawn of life and that's why we're talking about them first before i start talking about bacteria next week is because these guys at bacteria have had an arms race that makes our arms races between countries look like nothing so um and interestingly enough the more we study them and bacteria the more we can actually use them each other against each other uh which is actually really useful so um i put up some silly things here because um a i'm silly if you haven't noticed by now um i actually own these uh, if you go to a place called giantmicrobes.com, um, you can buy your own giant microbes and other things. You can They have, you know, animal cells and plant cells, anything microscopic. Um, they also have organs, too, for, you know, plushy versions with eyeballs. So they're happy to see you. So I actually own two of these. I own this one, COVID-19, because, you know. And then I also own this one down here. If you don't notice, that's Ebola. Um and then over the years, I've had many people give me more as gag gifts. But my son, who's eight, when he was in first grade, um, he loved Ebola. He keeps stealing it from me. In fact, I had to go dig it out again. It's in his room. Um, he loves it. I don't know why. I know it's like, how could he love such a monstrous virus? But he just thinks it's the fuzzy version that doesn't kill people. It's very cute. And... Um, he took it to school for show and tell, held it up and goes, 
I have Ebola. And his teacher was like, yeah. <laughs> she's like, yep. And she's just like, so is someone in your family a biologist? And Wesley goes, yeah, my mom. And I'm like, oh, yeah. There you go. So, yeah, I have the fuzzy version of a lot of viruses, which are much nicer than the actual versions. Just not going to lie. Anyway, so remember, we have to kind of go back over something that hopefully you touched on last semester, and that is what is life? And um, we talked about how to distinguish biotic and abiotic things. That's why we have a list of basically the characteristics of living organisms. So this is kind of a trip to the beginning of last semester and the fact that there's four, but some books list way more like right here. Um, so, you know, technically they have to have an orderly structure. You know, uh, we don't have eyeballs um, in our, in our, in our, uh, in our uh, elbows. Uh, we produce offspring uh, and, um, you know, uh, so that way our species can continue on into the future. We grow and develop. We don't stay as babies. We actually turn into, you know, more adult versions of ourselves. Um, like my son, he is not the same size as at eight that he is what he was when he was born. Not the same size at all. And we adjust to changes in the environment. In other words, you know, if it's cold out, we try to get warm. We do things, you know, our physical body does things like, you know, raise our hairs and vibrate more. So that way we make more, we generate more heat. And if not, then we'll start, you know, actually constricting our blood vessels to protect our inner organs. And unfortunately that leads to frostbite and loss of fingers and toes um stuff like that or if we're hot we start sweating we start breathing a lot so that way we're trying to again try to cool down our temperature so we don't hurt all the enzymes and everything inside of our body that need to keep us alive so we adjust the changes in the environment things you don't see rocks doing you know you don't see a rock sweating um you don't see a rock putting on a jacket because it's cold i mean if you do mm, you might want to check your food might have been spiked uh and over here are some more, again, order, uh, sensitivity, response to environment, that's just as change, reproduction, adaptation, so we can survive to reproduce, because that's the name of the game in biology, really. Uh, growth and development, regulation, homeostasis, our friend oh friend And trust me, if you think you're not going to hear about homeostasis uh, ever again, yeah, you may not, because if you're choosing to just get this out of the way and move on to a different thing and not, you know, follow biology, which is completely fine. Um, still, homeostasis is the name of the game. That's where we basically spend energy to maintain a stable environment on the inside so we can continue living so we don't just, you know, randomly drop dead because it gets cold outside. Um, so homeostasis, name of the game. If you continue on in biology, I assure you every course is going to come back to homeostasis all the time. He's a big boy in biology. Um, energy processing, in other words, you know, for us, heterotrophs we you know go and eat food like for instance i have um you know a bunch of pumpkin seeds i've been munching on um or the blueberries i consumed for breakfast um uh i had other things too but i'm just saying you know we we get the we're heterotrophs because we have to go out and find food to eat not make food because i had somebody kind of get confused about the difference between autotrophs and heterotrophs Remember, autotrophs make their own uh, sugars, glucose, using uh, either the processes of using the sun in uh, photosynthesis or a chemical way, which is a lot of life forms around um, hydrothermal vents down the ocean. They actually are designed to go in and suck out all the materials out of the hydrothermal vents and turn it into food. Uh, and that's how a lot of those uh, creatures way, 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 way down live. Um, so we don't do that. We don't we don't bake bread in our stomach and then pop out a loaf of bread out our left nostril. That would be interesting. But no, that's not what we do. Um, we have to actually ingest things to suck out the nutrients from inside. And that's our whole digestive system right there in a nutshell. Uh, literally, that's why we're heterotrophs. We have to go find food and eat the food even if we cook it into a delicious meal um 
that's still being a heterotroph. We just have the extra step of cooking it because interestingly enough, humanity has changed to adapt to that. Uh, that's actually why our uh, intestinal tract is not as long as other mammals that eat raw food uh, because we're designed to actually uh, speed run uh, digestion. Yes, we speed run our own digestion by cooking it first. If we cook it first, then we have to spend less time breaking it down. And because we spend less time breaking it down, we have more time sucking out the nutrients we need. So yeah, humanity in inventing cooking has uh, learned how to speed run digestion. So yeah, and that's why I get a little annoyed lately with this new trend of eat raw, which, you know, I love sushi. Don't get me wrong. I am a sushi person, 100%. Some fish taste way better raw than cooked um but there's there's people running around on instagram and this is me just getting on my soapbox here but uh no we're uh built to cook the food first it's our speed run for maintaining our metabolism raw actually makes it not as efficient us not very efficient so just fyi and that and parasites yay parasites because if you get the raw meat from somewhere wrong parasite land anyway and it's not fun anyway just that was my two cents i'll get off my box now and off my box okay so just things i see on the internet make me go anyway so now speaking of parasites but aren't really parasites uh these are viruses so viruses are non-cellular parasitic entities that cannot be classified within any kingdom they infect organisms as diverse as bacteria plants and animals thank god the majority of them actually are in a perpetual war with bacteria there are ones that i am so thankful that they're not interested in human cells whatsoever they're all about bacteria and bacteria is all about attacking some of them that's actually where we got some of our uh, latest technology if you've heard of the crispr technology i'll actually get into that in a little bit uh we actually learned about that little uh technology that it, it's something that bacteria developed and we kind of stole from bacteria to fight viruses which is really interesting so anyway um plants uh, we have this is actually one of the things that triggered us to know there's a difference between viruses and bacteria a lot of people get them confused but remember a bacteria is a cell a virus is not and we'll get into why uh, um, viruses are kind of a neither world between the living and the non-living and some some scientists will argue they're living and some scientists will argue they're non-living i'm in the non-living camp um i think they're kind of like zombies to me uh because they don't really have the same kind of function uh that cells do cells you know cells thrive and live and you know viruses kind of do too but they just seem to mindlessly reproduce and that's all their only their only objective uh but it's interesting so for the longest time we are not aware of viruses and they're because they're way too small for light microscopes we could see bacteria fine so for the longest time in science anything that infected humans and got us sick or plants um and anything we looked at we just sat there and kind of lumped them all together because we didn't realize there was somebody else so we were like ah bacteria and then um, there was a Russian scientist, and we'll get to him in a minute. He made these cer ceramic filters that were so fine that it actually got rid of all the bacteria in a sample that strained them out. And all that was left was something that was still infecting plants. And he was like, huh, what is that? And that is uh, viruses. So speak of, speaking of, let's go ahead and talk about people that basically started going, hmm, about viruses. So in 1796, uh, and again, I don't expect you to remember dates. I'm just putting it out there just in case you want to Google what was happening in that year, uh, you know, for reasons. Um, so Edward Jenner vaccinated an eight-year-old boy named James Phipps from material from cowpox lesion on the hand of a milkmaid named Sarah Nelms. Um James, who had never had smallpox, developed a very tiny lesion on his hand at the site of the vaccination, which healed in two weeks. And then he decided to challenge the boy by deliberately inoculating him with smallpox, and he lived. 
he lived. And the reason was is because Edward Jenner basically went out one day and he noticed that, you know, smallpox was a huge problem back then, especially in the, yeah, six, was it 1800s? Yeah, this is 1800s, this is 19. It's always weird how they do that. Anyway, you think it'd be the 1700s, but hey, I wasn't consulted on this stuff. Anyway, so at that age, uh, smallpox was a huge problem. But uh, Jenner noticed that uh, milkmaids that worked with cows all day long, uh, they never got smallpox. And he was like, wait, why don't these milkmaids ever get smallpox? And it was because um, they were, were working with cows, cows get cowpox and they'd sometimes it would jump to the humans that were constantly living so very close with them and um, this is actually how a lot of viruses got into human population uh they um you know became inoculated over time to cowpox and he sat there and he goes you know cowpox and smallpox are very similar and this he was just looking at you know what happens when somebody gets sick with it with the cow getting sick with cowpox and a human getting sick with smallpox and then a human also getting sick with cowpox he basically you know compared and contrasted the symptoms and everything and sat there and said wow these are these are actually kind of kind of similar isn't that weird um and he couldn't even see the virus at that point keep in mind you know he didn't realize exactly what he was dealing with but he knew he was dealing with something and he actually was the first one to kind of touch on basically where uh, that something was causing this and you could inoculate people against it by giving something similar into the system, letting your immune system adapt to it. And then um, it would uh, be, you'd be immune to it afterwards. So it was kind of interesting. Um, now, and this actually, smallpox is actually something human civilization kind of created. And I don't mean like in a you know, Illuminati, let's wear tinfoil hats kind of way. I mean, it's because we started uh, living together and we started making civilizations. And then we started domesticating animals, cows being one of the first. Cows and horses and dogs and cats felt like it later. <laughs> Cats chose to domesticate themselves, I swear. And we'll get into that later. Um, ancient Egyptian times. Hey, can I come in and live with you? Cool, cool. I'm fluffy and cute. I'll kill all your mice that's eating your grain. Work? All right. Sounds good. So anyway, whereas dogs were way earlier than that. Anyway, but uh, because we were living in not very clean conditions, keep in mind, you know, hygiene, at the dawn of civilization, what is not exactly the best, if any. So uh, you're living, you know, in a hut with a bunch of people in huts, close proximity. You also have your cows, which are in a pen, maybe next to your hut. Who knows? Sometimes your cow might break into your hut. I know I used to live on a farm. Uh, so horses, you know, occasionally would break out of their house. <laughs> their barn they're not stupid we had to put special kind of you know some barns to have double locks on the uh, stalls because uh, horses aren't stupid <laughs> and some cows are not stupid either so you know the break out of things walk into your house go hey human feed me so anyway unfortunately when you're living together in that kind of environment viruses from one species unfortunately will jump to another species this we've seen this happen over and over again uh that's actually where the flu came from uh influenza came from birds um and it actually jumped to us uh during the uh great uh flu pandemic influenza the spanish flu uh, pandemic which is what set flus upon us because people back then and i don't mean like you know edward jenner times i mean fast forward a little bit to around what was it world war one era titanic era people were keeping especially in cities even in new york city were keeping uh chickens in uh, cages off their window so they could get eggs for free which you know sounds like a great idea right now with egg prices going beep. but at the same time it's a lot of work to keep chickens so just let you know firsthand if you're thinking go going i'm gonna go get chickens i'm gonna go get chickens mm. 
research at first. Anyway, long story short, though, because people were literally living next to their chickens in cities where people are packed together like sardines to begin with, just like in pre-civilization with cows, the flu jumped from birds into humans because, again, conditions were right. Two species were living very close together. Um, you know, sanitation isn't what it was like it is today. Um, and unfortunately, that's what happened at the beginning of civilization, human civilization. That's where smallpox came from. Came from cowpox, jumping from cows into humans and turning into a new virus called smallpox. And smallpox is the oldest of the... Uh, human viruses we actually have a lineage for it and everything uh flu too uh flu came from birds jumped from birds into us and then we have we've been dealing with the flu ever since i mean that's why we have flu shots uh so you know a lot of viruses unfortunately jump from one species to another because everybody's living in proximity to each other way too closely and it's usually high populations so that's basically so it's a good place he started with smallpox because that's the oldest of the viruses that have been affecting humans since pretty much we brought it upon ourselves by domesticating cows. If we had known, but still, steak is good. So, you know, we need cows. So anyway, now, in 1892, we've got a uh, Russian botanist uh, who basically made these uh, ceramic filters. Uh, Dmitry, I'm going to butcher this and I apologize. I want to ask Waski. I want to Waski. I want to Waski. Okay. So anyway, I could probably butcher that. So I apologize. So anyway, he made, he basically noticed diseased tobacco plants. And we're going to bring this up a lot when we're talking about viruses. Um, tobacco plants, diseases on tobacco plants really interested us because uh, A, Tobacco leaves, if you've seen them, are huge. So you can really see, plus it was pretty important back then, uh, crop, money crop, because everybody was smoking pipes, cigars, you know, roll your own cigarettes back then. Um, so that was a big thing. So, you know, we don't like diseases. So it was interesting because he made these ceramic filters, as I mentioned earlier, that basically filtered out the smallest of the small bacteria and um what was left was viruses so this is generally recognized between these two events as the beginning is of virology which is the study of viruses however neither iwanowski or the scientific community fully realized basically the results of this because they're just sitting there going well is it another bacteria no it's not so that's the fun thing about that one so it wasn't until the 1930s when we invented electron microscopes we could finally finally see these guys uh, most virions or uh, virus particles are very very small about 20 to 250 nanometers in diameter and some of them have been recently discovered from amoeba range up in the 100 so there are some big viruses and i'm actually we're you're going to do one of the uh, interactive videos that I've got for you. Oh, by the way, get back to me if you actually like those or, you know, I'm going to try and do more interesting things with them, but let me know. Um, you know, I like feedback. I should put up a thing about feedback. Yes, I should. I should put something up for you guys to feedback for me. Anyway, so I want to show you a video right here. I'm going to cut for a moment because, you know, you see these pictures and it's like, okay, so here's our human red blood cell and here's these, and you go, all right, yeah, but it's not as interesting as there's a guy I really like and I pulled up his video and I'm going to show it to you. Let me go ahead and full screen it. So this is Metal Ball Studios. Uh, they do uh, size comparisons and some other stuff that's really fascinating. Um, definitely uh, give a shout out if you ever want some interesting things. He does like sci-fi ships. Um, he also does like mechas and things like that. So if you're into like, you know, anime and sci-fi and stuff like that, like I am, um, then you'll probably get a kick out of some of his content where he does size comparisons. I, I enjoy it. So anyway, we're going to watch this and there isn't much talking and I'll try to I'll bring down the noise so that way I'm not talking over the music. Well, I'm, you know. So Metal Ball Studios. So this is comparing. So this is the rhinovirus. This literally is the cold virus. 
So rhinovirus is the cold virus. Yeah, it just looks like a nugget of something. So here's polio. Similar size. Here we jump to the flu. And you may go, wow, the flu looks a lot like um, uh, what Corona kind of does. Sort of, kind of. There's actually lineages of different uh, viruses. Uh, Corona is out of the SARS virus lineage. Uh, flu is out of its own lineage, uh, influenza lineage. And the cold is out of the rhinovirus uh, lineage, which is kind of interesting. So yeah, we actually do have lineages of different viruses. So um, flu and COVID are not that, re they're related, but not that related. They're in two different subsets. So it's, it's interesting. So SARS, it's definitely out of the SARS family, not out of the flu family. So there's rabies. Uh, the bacteriophage. The, this guy we're going to talk, you are going to have a video that you're going to watch later that we're going to watch him. And thank God he's not interested in us because these viruses out, uh, these T4 bacteriophages are built for one thing that's attacking bacteria. We actually use these guys to help uh, us uh, install gen uh, uh you know, uh, DNA into uh, bacteria. I've actually done that in the lab. I've actually used bacteriophages to put DNA into bacteria. So um, we actually use these guys in genetics. Um, thank goodness they haven't started a revolt. They're only interested in one thing, that's bacteria and not us. So remember, viruses and bacteria are not the same thing. They actually, in fact, hate each other uh, if they're designed to. Like I said, the T4 bacteria phage at the moment is our friend. He is not our enemy, and we don't want to turn him into making him our enemy because it, it, it bleh, would be bad. So uh, you're going to have a video about him, uh, uh, one of the interactive videos about him. He's a really fascinating guy. We like him. This is smallpox. So this is what I was talking about with the cowpox. So these are viruses. Now we're going to jump to prokaryotes. So we're talking about we have gone from viruses... And look how tiny they are. And now we're going into bacteria. So this is staphylococcus. This is what causes staph infections. Lactobacillus. This helps us break down uh, lactose. E. coli. Here's another friend of ours. He is a bacteria. I know he looks like a freak of nature, but he's also somebody that we use constantly to genetically manipulate in labs. I've used him repeatedly myself. Um, if you take microbiology uh, here, I know for a fact you're going to be playing with E. coli. So um, yeah, they're 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 kind of like one of our there's there's certain creatures <laughs> in, in biology that we use over and over and over again to do a lot of genetic things. And one of these guys is E. coli. He's he's kind of our buddy, but at the same time he can get us sick. So that's why we have to be very careful with him and very careful when we uh, go into labs and work with um, uh, these guys because we don't want some of the ones who are changing their DNA around, we don't want them leaving. Um, and so that's why when you go into a lab, you never uh, put on makeup or eat food because, or drink, you know, put your drinks in a separate place. And I uh, definitely stress that because we do do microbiology here at Blue Ridge and um, FYI, these guys can get you sick. So that's why we always clean off our desks before you sit down and you don't eat or put on makeup or drink uh, in, you know, a microbiology lab because you're just asking for these guys to come in and hug you on the inside and make you sick and go to the hospital. So yeah. Yeah. But we like to play with them. I play with them. Now we're jumping from prokaryotes to eukaryotes. This is a human red blood cell. Already, look at the size difference. So we can barely even see uh, the rhinovirus, the cold virus down over here. But over here, I mean, look how big our red blood cell is compared to these tiny, tiny little viruses. This is why I like this video so much. Here's baker's yeast. Here's a skin cell. Here's a human sperm cell. 
here's pollen, which is plant sperm. Uh, yeah, this is literally a plant. Uh, pollen is literally plants, uh, plant sperm. Uh, so if you're allergic to pollen, you're allergic to plant sperm. You're welcome. I just wanted to make that awkward for you because, you know, I like using my scientific things to make life awkward. Here's a neuron. It makes up our nervous system, our brain, our nerves, and our spine, spinal cord. Here's a human egg cell. Here's a euglena. They're adorable. They're fun to chase around in pond water, which we have lots of pond water out there. Diatoms are beautiful. If you've ever, and I know I'm supposed to be talking about viruses right now, but uh, Google diatoms if you want really pretty things. They are little creatures that make silicone shells for themselves out of silica, and they're absolutely gorgeous. Um, and they're all so mathematical. They're very pretty. They come in way a bazillion different mathematical shapes. So if you ever want a fun time of just looking at Nat natural mathematic art uh google diatoms and they're absolutely gorgeous they look like little glass houses uh made in the most beautiful ways and it's these little sim sil uh excuse me single-celled organisms building little houses out of silica it's beautiful and paramecium here's an amoeba Amoeba, amoeba, amoeba. Keep in mind, none of these are actually the color he's got. He's just choosing here. And here's our dark green, our water bears. They're, technically, he's the dominant species on Earth. And a hare, a frog egg and a hare. Can you see the viruses anymore? No, you can't. So there you go. Uh, like I said, I wanted to completely show you the transition of from virus to prokaryote, to eukaryote, to definitely illustrate just how freaking tiny viruses are, and they are so tiny. So that's why it's like, you know, people are like, oh yeah, the same thing. No, 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 no. I gotta move myself a bit. Boop. Go back to slideshow. Okay, there we go. So back. So again, I like that video because I think it illustrates better than this picture ever will of just how crazy small these guys are. Whoop, 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 going too far. All right, so so where did these guys come from? Where did viruses come from? You're like, well, you know, if they're not alive or not dead, you know, what what came first, the chicken or the egg? It's, it's, it's the egg. Um, Eggs came way before chickens, unless you're talking about chicken eggs, but even then, eggs. So, so regressive hypothesis. So basically, this suggests that viruses evolved from free living cells um, and from intracellular prokaryote uh, parasites. They just kind of like, so life came first, and then somehow something popped out that was acting not quite right. Um, and we've kind of like, for instance, it shows over here. Let me get my uh, laser pointer out right here, very early uh, pool of replicants. So basically what happens is sometimes, and we've seen this, um, DNA or RNA that's loose in the system could do a lot of damage. And we've seen this in cases, for instance, um, there's uh, tribes in, I want to say South America, but I'm not, probably not right on that. I'm going to have to double check. But um, there are... Um, there are tribes that practice, you know, they eat the, their honored dead, especially the brains, because they feel that, you know, if they eat the brain after they die, you will inherit the wisdom of the person who just died, which, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's their tradition. However, they eat it raw. And this is where we get uh, bits of DNA called purons that actually can get up into uh, the person who just ate the raw brain um, and unfortunately gets them sick. And it's kind of like a precursor to a virus. It's a snippet of loose DNA that didn't get digested and it's out and about and a cell sucks it up and it's incomplete and it starts telling the cell to do strange things which makes the cells do strange things and can get the person very, very sick. And we've seen this over and over again in those cultures that, you know, practice that, you know, uh, ritualistic cannibalism to honor their dead. 
by and just you know thinking they're going to ingest the wisdom of the person but unfortunately they get sick instead so there is that um the other one is the escapist or progressive hypothesis this suggests that dna's came uh, basically originated from dna or uh, rna molecules self-replicating um it basically escaped the host cell with the ability to enter another. And we'll get into how viruses get in in a minute as well. And then there's the virus first hypothesis that suggests that viruses may have been the first self-replicating entities before cells even came along, which is interesting. Um, so what came first, life or viruses? We don't know. We've got the three thoughts. Again, you'll notice it has the word hypothesis under after each one of them because none of these are theories because none of these have been, you know, supported or not supported in any form or fashion at the moment. It's just our possible thoughts. And in the future, we may knock some of these out to get a theory. We may not. It may take, you know, centuries or it may be one of those things that we need a, you know, magic time machine to go back in time. Come on, Miss Frizzle, get on it. Anyway. So let's break it down. What is basically a virus? So viruses has a nucleic acid core, which is either DNA or RNA. Um, it always has to have DNA or RNA in its center. Without that, it's useless. And it has a protein coating around it called a capsid. So it doesn't even have cell membrane. So another, you know, it is not a um, cell. It doesn't have a cell membrane. It just has a protein capsule called a capsid. And sometimes it has an outer envelope. So it has like a double layer uh, made of proteins and phospholipid membranes derived from a host cell. Cause some, some of them are like Trojan horses. They'll pick up something and go, yeah, I'm like you. And then like the cells like, oh. So anyway, um, and it has a lot of these uh, protein things sticking out. So these things right here are very important because they're designed to hook onto a receptor on a cell. So that's how it sneaks into a cell or comes up to a cell, grabs a hold and injects its DNA or RNA. And we're gonna get into the different types, but these, these things are designed to hook onto its target cell. So that way it hooks onto it and the cell doesn't even notice it's there um because it's not doing anything crazy it just hooks on and like i said some of them go through inside and some of them don't and the cell is completely hoodwinked it's sitting there going do you feel that no it must be in my imagination <laughs> so the cell has these receptors that go perfectly you know for these uh proteins that stick out and um And basically that's a cell and it comes in different shapes. Uh, there's a lot of different shapes. Uh, some of them are just like loops, like Ebola is just like a literal loop that does two more loop-de-loops at the end. Um, uh, you know, we looked at the bacteria phage, which looks like a freaking spider nightmare from, you know, sci-fi heck. Uh, stuff like that. So it's, it's kind of a, it's, some of them look like a wadded up, you know, a piece of snot it's, it's you know it depends on what they're trying to get at so how do we classify these guys well we classify them in four ways and there's there's three ways or three major ways to classify this first way is shape so the shape way is basically here so helical viruses so you have their capsid and their rna is like coiled like this so it looks like a spring um, this is the most famous of these guys is the tobacco mosaic virus, which is something that once we figured out what it was and what it did, which was kill off crops of tobacco, we've had lots of interesting times having fun with that one in the lab. So anyway, they kind of have like this slinky shaped capsid that twists around and closes the genetic material. Um, another one of those guys is definitely rabies. Rabies kind of looks like that too. It's the elongated one. So those are the helical viruses. Uh, then you got the polyhedral viruses, which are known as adrenoviruses, which cause uh, pink eye pneumonia. It's usually these guys. They look like, uh, you know, they look like a 20 sided die because they have 20 sided triangular faces. So for those of us that play games like D and D uh, and, um, 
uh, <laughs> Magic the Gathering like I do. Uh, yeah, these are the 20-sided dyes from Heck. So yeah, uh, so if you've ever had pink eye or pneumonia, an evil 20-sided die started it for you. Rude. Anyway, spherkles. So these are guys like flu, coronavirus. Um, they basically got a helical viruses enclosed in a membrane known as an envelope, and they have these spiked uh, protein sticking out, which basically assists in them uh, sticking to and entering cells. Again, remember, they have these things that stick out that basically correspond to a receptor protein on the cell it's aiming for. And Corona likes going after lung cells. That's why it hangs out in the lung. Um, the flu kind of like has the same thing. So some of these guys are designed to only go after one type of cell. The corona just happened to be, you know, ready to go for lungs. And unfortunately, we have some. Hmm. Anyway, now, complex viruses are the freaks. These things look like just absolute aliens. So these are bacteriophages for the most part. They look like lunar landers. They've got a head with the DNA, and they've got this tail sheath, and they've got these tail fibers which look like legs and they attach so it can transfer the genetic material so basically it's kind of like his own injection thing so he lands and then goes and you know injects his dna and then it falls away so yeah and think of an evil lunar lander and that's basically what a complex virus is and these guys like i said thank goodness the majority of viruses are these psychos right here and thank goodness they're only interested in bacteria and not in us, or else we wouldn't be here right now talking and having a lecture and you wouldn't be watching me. We wouldn't have technology, a lot of other things like that. So yeah, I hope they stay hanging with the bacteria because, but we have to deal with these jerks. Yeah, jerks. Anyway, so another way we can classify it by genome structure so in other words, if it's got RNA and DNA, uh, it gives us rabies, retroviruses, uh, herpes of viruses, smallpox virus. Now, if it's single-stranded, then uh, the, D you know, the RNA or the DNA is single-stranded. Usually it's RNA is single-stranded, so that's rabies, retroviruses. Retroviruses are always RNA. That's what we mean by retrovirus. There's viruses and they have DNA. And then we discovered that uh, later on that some, not everybody's got DNA in his capsid. Uh, some of them have RNA instead. And that's the retroviruses. So when somebody says retroviruses, they don't mean some old, you know, virus. They're talking about uh, viruses with RNA instead of DNA. Um, if they're linear, again, if they're circular, if they're non-segmented, if they're segmented, this is what we, it's just, classic by genome structure how does the dna and the rna look so that's what we mean by genome structure not the outside like this one but how the genetics looks inside how it's you know held up all right now we have come up with the current one which is uh the baltimore classification and that's basically on a relationship between the viral genome and the mRNA needed for translation. I am not going to beat you with this because it's, yeah. I mean, you've probably been told there's like, you know, oh, there's, oh yeah, mRNA. I remember mRNA from last semester it had something to do with translation and transcription and making proteins and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, there's a bit different flavors of RNA. There's actually about 11. And then even this, does different classes. So this was the most common and currently used system of viral uh, developed by Nobel Prize winning. And honestly, with this much insanity going on, yeah, he earned it. Uh, David Baltimore in the early 1970s. And it basically, in addition to morphology and genetics, so it basically takes the two types we just talked about, combines them, and a group sum according to how mRNA is made during the, uh, the virus hijacking a cell. Like I said, I'm not going to go in any deeper than that because uh, we don't have time for that. We're the brain space. So anyway, how does this work? There's two different flavors of this. There's the lytic cycle and the, um, uh, the longer cycle. So what happens for the most part in a lytic cycle is this. So a virus uh, comes up on his destination cell. 
that he really, really likes. And remember, he's got all these things uh, the outside. They're called antigens, by the way. Another name for these is antigens, which is where antibodies come from. Well, I'll get to that in a bit. So anyway, so he comes up and he hooks onto his target cell. And the cell either does one or two things. He'll inject his uh, genetic material, which is DNA or RNA, or he'll go inside. Because some of these guys actually trigger the cell to think he's going to eat something. So the cell goes, oh, look, a snack just came to me. Oh, and that was wrong because he wasn't a snack. He was a virus. So yeah, some viruses trick cells into thinking they're getting a snack. They're not. Don't trust that snack. Yes. That, 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 uh, that, uh, what was it? Yeah. That, uh, oh, shoot. Now I can't think of it. Um, that snack food was not kind. Anyway, so he gets in and he breaks down and he releases his genetic material, which can be DNA or RNA. In D if it's DNA, what happens is the cell's kind of stupid about that because if it sees loose DNA, it's like, hey, what's all that? And if it's a eukaryote with a nucleus, the thing it's going to do literally is be like, uh, dude, that needs to like uh, go into... Uh, the uh, nucleus so it actually will drag it and put it into the nucleus with the rest of the dna if it's a prokaryote it just literally snaps into place in the rest of the dna because dna is dna so the cell is just like mm, gotta stick that with the rest of my dna you know so anyway so then the cell replicates uh viral protein uh, and so basically the cell starts reading it starts doing it and starts making more parts and making more parts and making more parts and then it starts putting together the parts that it's reading because it's got the, the viral d uh, instructions inside the uh, dna you know inside its own dna so it tricks the cell into making more viruses puts together the viruses to the point where it lyses or it pops and it explodes and more cells are and more viruses are out and kills the cell itself so that's that kind of fun right there. Um, so that's called the lytic cycle because it lyses. Remember L-Y-S, uh, lyse means to break down. So this cycle basically makes more viruses as it kills the whole cell and breaks it down. That's why it's called the lytic cycle. Make sense? Okay. Now there's other ones called the lysogenic cycle. Now the lysogenic cycle is basically like the lytic except prolonged in other words this is cold sores so if you have cold sores welcome you already know the lysogenic cycle what happens is instead of instantaneously hijacking the cells uh, uh stuff to make more things instantly which is the lytic cycle the lysogenic cycle is where it goes into stasis and um the dna or the rna goes into uh, the nucleus or the, uh, you know, the loop of back, uh, DNA, bacterial DNA, and they sit there and they uh, just lay dormant for a while. They just sit back and the, the bacteria, the eukaryotic cells replicate, 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 go through their daily lives. And because of this, the virus doesn't need to infect because every cell that's made gets made with that viral DNA. See what I'm saying? He's just laying back, letting the cell do his thing and multiplying, 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 multiplying while unknowingly multiplying all that viral DNA along with the, the uh, regular bacterial DNA or eukaryotic DNA. And unfortunately, then something makes it trigger. And then all of a sudden it goes crazy. It goes from the lysogenic cycle of, you know, keeping your head down not exploding goes into the lytic cycle and starts making more of itself more of itself more of itself and then killing the host so it goes straight from laying low into active and that can be any number of triggers um it could be uh the food derived like if the they're not getting enough nutrients it could be chemical it could be you know especially in us humans you know hormonal anything like that could trigger it from going from the lysogenic cycle which is it's laying low into the lytic cycle where it's building up more and making more viruses to spread. So unfortunately, the lysogenic cycle is like cold sores um, and it's and herpes. It's hard to get rid of because once it enters the cell, it really you can't distinguish its DNA from the cell DNA. So therefore it makes a ton of itself. And then all of a sudden it gets triggered 
and then you have a cold sore attack or you know another you know herpes attack or something like that Th those are the viruses that you've heard that you can contract and they go dormant for years and then all of a sudden they'll trigger and go crazy and then you know you'll feel it uh, another one of those is a lot of the sexually transmitted can be like that um syphilis uh, yeah a lot of fun so that's the difference between the two life cycles of uh, viruses, the lytic, where it basically goes in, hijacks, kills, and cycle repeat, or the lysogenic, it goes in, hijacks, lays low, waits for the cell to replicate, 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 gets triggered, then goes into the lytic cycle where it hijacks, makes a ton more of itself in all of the cells that have it, and explode from there and killing the, the host there that way. So, yeah. All right, now plants versus animals. Uh, plants and animals, we get infections in different ways. So in animals, uh, we follow a class uh, pattern of acute diseases where symptoms eventually increasingly get worse. And then our immune system kicks in and then we uh, it learns it, it basically takes it out. Uh, examples of this is a common cold. This is why we don't have a, virus, uh, a vaccine for the common cold because by the time it hits our system, um, our immune system's already working on it and uh, it can't work. It, it's, we can't make one to work as fast as our immune system can kick out a common cold virus. So that's unfortunately why we just have to live with common colds, but we have, you know, uh, vaccines for flu. You know, if you've ever wondered, you go, oh, well, why don't we have a vaccine for the common cold? Well, A, the common cold, there's like 600 different, very, actually, I think it's more than that. There's like a gazillion variations of the common cold. And we can't really predict which one's going to get huge because they all get huge. They all just transfer so easily. And thankfully, our immune system is so used to them that our immune system can take care of it way faster than getting a uh, um, uh, a shot would fix it. So uh, common cold just A, exits or cis, enters and exits too fast and mutates too dang fast. We would have to be... By the time we made a vaccine for one flavor, there's already about 600 flavors running around out there that's already mutated. So it mutates too quick and our systems are pretty well used to it. So we handle it pretty quick too. So it kind of negates the whole point of a vaccine. It, how, it's like a flash in the pan, even though we've all had colds and they're miserable. So we know it's not a great flash in the pan, but it's a flash in the pan. However, things like uh, acute, you know, uh, flu, you know, we do have vaccines for that. And that's a good thing because it is like predicting the weather. And I'll get into that when I talk about vaccines in a minute. So it's like, yeah. Uh, so other uh, viruses cause long-term chronic infections. This is like hepatitis C. This is like all the herpes variations. Uh, yeah, you know, like six and seven, which can cause mild childhood disease like roseola. But then, you know, later on, it's like, um, you know, one that, you know, definitely is uh, trying to think of it, chicken pox. And then it turns into uh, shingles later in life. And shingles is, I've been told psychotically painful because my grandma had it because it was before the shingles vaccine and she was just like oh god i wish i had that because she got hit with shingles a couple of times so it's it's kind of a hot mess <laughs> um anyway so long story short where was i do, 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 do. so now so they can, they have asymptomatic infection. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Like when you, you, you have cold sores, you know, you have cold sores, but you don't have an eruption currently. Yeah. That's an asymptomatic infection. Now, um, some animal, including hepatitis C are known as oncogenic because unfortunately they cause cancer, which is why we came up with the vaccine for, um, you know, uh, the, uh, well, a couple of one of the uh, herpes viruses because they can actually cause cancer later on down the light or, or road. And that's why it was a big breakthrough for, um, you know, getting, uh, was it hep C? Yeah, the hep C. So they can cause, you know, cancer further on down the road. So anyway, now, how do viruses get past the cell wall? 
Now that's a good question because these guys sell, you know, we have cell membranes. We're easy. Like I said, you know, it just clicks on plants have a cell wall. So how do they get past that? Cause that thing is like an impenetrable barrier. Well, unfortunately, a lot of the times it comes in through infected pollen, which doesn't have as much of a cell wall. So the cell wall can come in and it can just stay, uh, not even infecting the plant itself. It actually uh, just keeps making infected seedlings and then that will make more. Um, again, another one is it comes in and virus infect uh, pollen to other plants. And again, so it can do vertical transmission where it comes in and makes uh, you know viable children or seeds and they, the seeds go on and turn into infected seedlings sick plants or it goes horizontal where it basically comes off a infected plant and then heads in through its infected pollen that way so plants weaknesses is its own reproductive cycle it's one of the one places where the cell wall does not protect it anyway how do you make vaccines now making vaccines is like the major important crazy thing going on here and that is there's four ways to make a vaccine and more. Um, so what we used to do is we used to, uh, and this is uh, actually pioneered by um, Louis Pasteur. Um, he's the guy that came up with pasteurization and he took a risk. So what we did is we, uh, he took uh, rabies and killed it. And then he injected it in uh, people unfortunately, kind of illegally. Um, I'll get to that story in a minute. And um, the dead virus triggered the immune response and the immune response learned it and um, basically uh, killed it. So that the way when the full live virus would come in, the immune system already knew what it was and could kill it faster. And therefore you didn't get sick. Um, or you had a very, very, very mild reaction and you lived. And so unfortunately, Pasteur did this kind of in a very, very quasi, not really legal way. What happened is he had developed the vaccine, but he really was, um, he wanted to go through human trials, but he couldn't really do it. Um, he had a uh, assistant. They were ready to go through with human trials. But what had happened was uh, a young boy had been savaged by a uh, rabid dog and his mother and him walked. I mean, the kid's leg was in tatters. They walked from their small rural town in France to Paris to find uh, Pasteur and begged him to save the boy's life because they knew he was gonna get rabies and die because the dog was rabid. And so Pasteur had the vaccine. It wasn't tested yet at all. And he said, this is too perfect of an opportunity. I'm going to give it to the boy. His assistant was horrified at uh, his insistence at doing this. Absolutely horrified. He even quit over this because he's like, I'm not going to be here for you to kill this kid. And thankfully for Pasteur, it worked. It saved the boy's life. And that's how he became famous in making the first vaccine in an activated vaccine. Um, and that's what we did for a lot of things afterwards. We tried inactivating with vaccines, but sometimes it didn't work. Um, and that was really the case with polio. And so polio was huge. And um, and this is something that, you know, I we defeated polio with a vaccine. This is why we don't have uh, people living in iron lungs anymore. There are only like a handful of people around the world that still live in iron lungs. And um, that's actually why it's becoming really hard for them to find parts because nobody's building iron lung parts anymore because nobody needs iron lungs because of the polio vaccine. See what polio did was unfortunately would go in and it would completely immobilize you. You'd still be alive, um, but you couldn't, uh, you had, because you were immobilized, you couldn't breathe. So they actually had to put you in these huge machines called iron lung. And it would breathe for you by making a pressure differential outside of your body. So it would make your, your chest rise and fall so you could breathe. Without the iron lung, most people with polio would die. So polio was paralyzing people. 
to the point where they couldn't live outside of an iron lung. Um, some people could live in one, but couldn't sleep uh, outside of one. So there are some people that can actually get up and walk around on oxygen and they're fine during the day, but if they try to sleep, they die. So they actually have to sleep in an iron lung um, to protect them from suffocating them. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing to look at polio. And this is why we sit there and herald the making of vaccines. This is, this is our weapon, guys. This is our weapon that has made life livable for human populations or else we'd still have kids in iron lungs right now without vaccines. And I look at my son and I look at the pictures of a ward of children. Here, let me show you. It's, it's, it's. Yeah. Yeah. There's a the kid. They have a mirror so they can like kind of see what's going on. But here's entire wards of them. Imagine your kid sister, your kid brother, your your own children stuck in that for the rest of their lives because they can't breathe on their own. And there's still people that are alive today that live this. And this was normal back then. And without the polio vaccine, we'd still be like this. I can't look at my son and say, yeah, vaccines didn't do anything for us. Without them, we wouldn't be here. A lot, the majority of us. So anyway. Yeah, let me move myself a bit. There we go. All right. So, so that's basically what uh, Jonas Salk came up with. He came up with the attenuated vaccine, which basically is taking a virus but not killing it. Because some vaccines uh, that are dead would trigger immune response, so that way the uh, your immune system would learn it. But some of them being dead, like polio, you could kill polio and inject it into somebody, and your immune system would be like with that mm. and not do anything it wouldn't promote an immune response therefore the immune system wouldn't learn it see the immune system has to see it as a threat for it to respond and learn it and then you remember and then you know your immune system remembers it well if it's dead and it doesn't trigger it, it then it's useless so that was you know so for you know for it worked for like things like rabies but the the dead but it didn't work for like things like polio and that's where Jonas Salk came in he basically took it the, the viruses and made them weaker so he made it super super weak so therefore it's still alive but not very deadly it, actually it's kind of like you know you know, how you feel when you're fine and then how you feel when you're sick. So he made viruses sick and made them like, uh, uh, so they're like trying to do their job, but doing a very lousy job at it. And it triggers the immune response. The immune response beats it up easily and then um, basically takes it and um, turns it into, you know, and, and basically, you know, again, oh God, I'm losing my words. I apologize. So the immune response triggers, the immune system learns it, and therefore you now have immunity towards it. And that's what was the huge breakthrough with Jonas Salk, Dr. Jonas Salk and the uh, polio virus. So this is dead. This is really beaten up, very, very weak. And then we came to modern times, like with the COVID vaccine. A lot of people have problems with the COVID vaccine because a lot of people think, oh, they developed it too fast. Actually, though what we've been doing is um we've been actually doing this for a while now um in trying to fight hiv um, a lot of the research that actually sped up the creation of the covid vaccine and why it was so fast is because a lot of the research was already there and i know you can sit there and go theory, the theory. but um unless it's on the chinese side i'm not really going there um I have thoughts, but I'm not going to put them here. But anyway, long story short, our response is not a uh, 
is not a conspiracy theory. The science is definitely there. They documented everything. It was not, you know, oh yeah, we're just making stuff up. Now, what we did is actually, we got really clever. So remember all those proteins on the outside? Well, we decided to shave them all off because if you tried to make a dead version of COVID, it didn't trigger the immune system. If you tried to make a weak version of COVID, COVID actually is pretty darn weak. It's only got a single wall. It can't even survive a trip through your... Uh, uh, digestive system so like if you swallow covid you're not going to get covid because you're it's so weak it gets destroyed like that the only place that's why it was so annoying because it gets in and really likes your lungs but it's a really weak virus so making it weak would just kill it and then we we're back to then we we're back to this one which is not again the immune system didn't was like yeah okay it's just trash kick it out yo so anyway so what we decided to do was hey why don't we shave all this stuff because this is technically the stuff that the, uh, your immune cells need to make antibodies. Because what an immune cell does is it makes these antibodies that glue themselves onto this and then make a whole bunch of it glue itself together. And then another white blood cell comes up the macrophage and goes, um, nom, 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 nom. So um, that's basically what's going on. So why don't we just use, instead of the whole virus with the RNA or the DNA inside, why don't we just uh, give it just the outside parts, which will trigger the immune response because it sees these proteins and goes, this doesn't belong in my body. And it makes a whole bunch of antibodies. So that way, when the full virus comes in covered in these antibodies, the immune system already sees those, anti um, sees those antigens, as they're called antigens, the sticky outy parts, the proteins right here, these are antigens. So already sees them and goes, oh, I've got the antibodies to kill you. So that's what's going on. So we shave them, trigger the immune response without giving you the whole virus. So we didn't give you the whole virus. We just gave you the outside proteins that trigger. So with it, no risk. And now we're looking at this, we're actually using uh, viral DNA and RNA to make, uh, so humans can make these and put them out for the immune system to do because uh, actually what some of the um, immune cells actually do is they'll actually take these reproduce them stick them on their own membranes and kind of like you know was it let's get gruesome here it's kind of like taking you know back in like england medieval england you take the the guy that you know stole or something did something bad or not depending on justice back then uh they'd hang the body outside the wall of the castle for a while to remind people not to do that you know um same thing it's, our cells kind of do that too with cell uh viral parts they actually chop it off hang it off their own cell membrane so another cell will come over and learn it and make the antibodies and go off and know to kill it and another cell the t-cell will come and learn it and go and find those with the same one and go kill it so um yeah some of the cells will actually take these and wear them <laughs> kind of like mad max style <laughs> you know putting skulls on your clothing you know don't mess with me it's like it's same thing except they're it's so the immune system sees them comes in and learns it and then walks off and does their job in killing the virus that has the same antigens on the outside so yeah so we're actually this is this is where the covid vaccine came from this this is literally the uh, cycle of how we learn to make vaccines over the centuries and it's actually really really interesting and it's really interesting to see where we're going because we're also looking at possibly using certain viruses to kill bacterial infections because like i said viruses hate bacteria and some viruses are only made to kill bacteria so what if we took the bacteria you get a bacterial infection that won't um that will not um you know respond to uh sorry will not respond to anti uh, antibiotics but what if we inject somebody with a virus just for that bacteria and the virus goes in kills all the bacteria and then our immune system cleans up from there it's actually already been done and it actually saved a guy's life so we might be using that that eons long battle here on earth between viruses and bacteria to our benefit which is a good thing, as long as we can make sure both of them don't spiral out of control and we don't make zombie viruses. All right, All right. I was kind of joking on that one. All right, so anyway, getting back to, like I said, you know, there's even weirder guys, and these are the prions and the viroids. So basically, um, prions 
as I mentioned earlier, we've kind of discovered these guys because there was, uh, you know, tribes that would eat brains of their deceased. And this is where these guys kind of come from. Um, brands are basically, they, they unfortunately most often affect the brain because they get up there and mess things up. This is actually, you ever remember mad cow disease? This literally was mad cow disease. Uh, if you remember the thing, we found out that we were feeding cows to cows and, you know, maybe we shouldn't have done that. And we made mad cow disease, which is bovine springiform, aka mad cow disease. It was easier to say that. So basically what happens is they act like a virus and they take over your nerve cells. And unfortunately, you kind of need your nerve cells to do things like thinking and moving and living and breathing and all that kind of good stuff. So unfortunately, uh you know, prion is basically a gene from your DNA, gets into something and it makes a whole bunch of it. And unfortunately, because of the way it folds up and screws up everything, it makes it so your nerve cells can't do the job. And unfortunately, this is where we think Alzheimer's may have came, come from. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, grandma was uh, eating other people at the time, but we think this has something to do with Alzheimer's. And it's a, a route we've been uh, investigating down um in trying to treat alzheimer's because we see a lot of this crazy folding in the brain especially of uh, proteins that lead to alzheimer's and that's unfortunately because it builds up plaque in the brain and that's a whole fun thing there so if we could stop this uh constant weird folding folding of mis screwed up proteins that basically gum up your uh brain function yeah, that would be great. So or that's one way we're using this research to kind of figure out how can we stop Alzheimer's. Now, viroids are the smallest, smallest, smallest um, of these virus-like. And they're unfortunately, uh, well, maybe for us, but unfortunately for you know any farmers, uh, these guys unfortunately go after uh, plants more than animals. So prions, usually in the animal department, viroids in the plant department. Um, so like this right here, it's literally a structure of a single stranded RNA line and that's looped around. And that's a, and with some voids right here where nobody can pair up, mismatches. And they affect oranges, potatoes, and cucumbers. So yeah, they're in our crops, unfortunately. They don't hurt us, but they do screw up our crops. Um, so, and you'll see some of these, like, you know, the, 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 uh, potato that looks like the face of uh, a cheeseburger or something like that it's like you've, you've seen some of them like when you pick an apple and the apple looks a bit funky some some of it's that and some of it's uh, somebody got in and was eating the apple before you so it you know these are the weirdos of even the weirdos group so viruses are weird these are even weirder and viruses could have come from something like these weird anyway so there you go um I actually just put this one up for you to do with the Amoeba Sisters. Um, I'm also going to put up a Curse of Scott's one, and I believe I have a Bozeman Science as well. So you're going to have three videos. I think you have two labs, two labs, three videos, and there will be a quiz. And I'm going to get that dichotomous key up this week, I swear. You're probably going, yeah, right, you don't have to. And I'm like, no, no, I do. I do. You need to know this. Anyway, um, uh, other than that, um, like I said, uh, just keep in mind, uh, you know, if you need anything, let me know. Just keep in mind, I may not be quick to get back to you on weekends. Um, so don't panic and think that I, you know, I've seen your messages on the weekends. It's just that, you know, I have family time and that's one of my boundaries in life is that I like to have a little bit of me time and that's the weekend. Um, during the week yeah definitely but i will always get back to you like first thing monday morning um you know as long as there's school on monday morning other than that uh next week uh no i think we should be good for next week i think i had something come up and i might not be i might have to take monday off but i don't think so now so i'm just gonna play it by ear so if the uh lecture video comes out a bit late next week don't panic um there's just something that's come up and i'm not entirely sure how that's going to play out nothing bad it's just something that's taking up my time is kind of weird but anyway all right with that said uh if you've got any questions uh let me know 
uh, remind, remember the remind, please. I do have the remind for a reason. It's actually how I messaged everybody about, you know, why uh, Flipgrid was being a jerk. So please uh, definitely, definitely, uh, you know, check the remind. If you're not part of the remind, here, let me show you. Please, 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 please. No, oh, that's the virus. Hold on. Go back to the beginning. Go back to course home. Sorry about that. If you go down, here's the remind app. Okay. If you haven't joined to get the text messages, I really would suggest it. It helps. So if there's anything coming up or anything like that, you know, definitely jump in here. Oh, there's a question discussion forum. Due date for week two, week two. Oh, <laughs> that was all about week two. But if you got questions, you can throw it there too. All right, with that said, remember, you know, remind, it's always a good way to go. And um, unless that's it, I can think of. Um, we'll probably be coming up on an exam here soon. And don't worry, I do review exams with people before I give them. So soon, soon. But other than that, okay. If you have any questions, you know, you know where to find me. All right. And remember, I'm always um in the lab in patent two two three from Monday, Wednesday, Fridays from uh 1 p.m. to 2 45 p.m. So if you need help and want to come and say hi face to face and meet my pet snake Monty, uh please come on down. Um, I'm here for you guys. So, you know, if you're having trouble with something or you want me to go over something like Punnett Squares or, you know, just generally talk to me about my plans for taking over the world, come on down. I'm here to help you guys get through. So until next week, take it easy, be safe, and I'll see you later. <laughs>